Hi, I'm Greg Dyke. I'm the chairman of the Football Association and I'm sorry I can't be with you at your meeting today, but can I just welcome you all here to Wembley? And in particular, can I say thanks to Supporters Direct and the Football Supporters Federation for helping to get this important conference going here today. OK, well, I'm chairman of the FA, but I'm basically a football fan. You know, I, I was a, a bog standard park footballer, but I've been watching football for most of my life. So essentially, my interest in football is the interest of the people who play it, but also the people who watch it. I mean, I think that supporters have a voice is incredibly important. And whether in the FA structure uh, they have a big enough voice yet, I think is, is up for discussion when we go back and look at governance in the autumn. Um, because I do think uh, we need to make sure that all parts of football have a voice and are represented at the FA. I set up the England Commission in the first place because the numbers scare me, and they still do. That actually we were down to 30% of the Premier League being English, being people, players qualified to play for England. And we're now actually below 50% in the Championship. And it seems to me the real danger is that we could end up with some very successful leagues in this country, but they're nothing to do with English football. And unless we do something about that, that's where we're going to be. Now, if you don't care, that's fine. It's a perfectly valid position to say, yeah, well, we're happy. But I'm not happy. The FA isn't happy because we all know that the f if, if we think we, were, we had a limited pool for this year's World Cup, you wait for four years and eight years' time if we don't do something about it. Now, I agreed uh, to answer a few questions about the report we published just before the summer on what we should do about getting more English players at the top level in English football. Well, of course, we, we knew change would be controversial and the ideas for change would be controversial. But let's look at the problem we were facing. Increasingly, Kids at the age of 18, the best footballers we've got at the age of 18, can't break through into the first teams in the Premiership and increasingly in the uh, Championship. Now, I don't believe that English kids are genetically worse than German kids or Spanish kids. I just don't believe it. Therefore, the question is, how do we get these kids experience when you've got some of the, the richest and most powerful leagues in the world. And the decline from 70 or percent in the Premiership to 30 percent and going down has to be addressed. Now, we went round and talked to a lot of the people who ran uh, the academies, and they told us that there is no, that kids at the age of 18 now need proper competitive football, and they couldn't get it in the Premier League because they couldn't make the breakthrough. So we looked at what happens in the rest of Europe. And what you find is in Spain and in Germany and in Holland, B teams, teams that play in the lower leagues. So that was what we started looking at. And the more we thought about it, the more we talked to people about it, the more interesting the idea became. Now. In the question says everybody is against this. That's not true. That's not true. Uh, most of the managers and coaches of the Premier League clubs have come out in favour of it because they know that there's a gap and you've got to get kids through that gap. They, you know, they call it all sorts of all sorts of things. The Bermuda Triangle is, is how some of them call it. Of kids that are coming through. You've only got to look at certain clubs. You know, take a club like Chelsea, incredibly successful youth side. Been successful for years now. Nobody gets through into the first team. And therefore we've got to find a way of getting those kids through. And B teams was one of the ideas.
It's not the only one. We've come up with some others. And uh, of course we knew there would be opposition. There always is opposition to change. You know, football isn't very good at embracing change. But what we were trying to do was say, hang on, there's a good way here. A lot of the, I mean, having, having chaired a lower league club for seven or eight years, I know how, um, how much financial difficulties many of them are in. Because let's not kid ourselves. Lower league clubs going into receivership is not going to stop. And what I was, could we, could we find a way of getting more money into those, into those clubs, which wasn't just spent on players, but will actually stabilise the club, at the same time as putting in B teams into the lower leagues, which meant kids of 18, 19 could get real competitive experience before they go back, possibly on loan in the championship and then possibly into the Premier League. But what I say to everybody who's, who's shouting and, and opposed, go on then. Where are your ideas? Because if you don't do something, let me tell you, we're in real trouble in this country. That's a good question. I like that question because, of course, it was in some ways. In some ways, what we're trying to say is, look, there is an issue here. And what we have certainly done is put that issue right up front. And that's an issue that I think football has ignored for 20 years, wrongly. And it's interesting, since we, lost, since we came back from the World Cup, how many players, how many coaches have come out and said, look, the pool of players available to England is too small and something's got to be done about it. Now, the problem is we're constricted by European law, although we'll look again, we're looking again at whether that can be changed. And we're looking at what can we change? Uh, and, and we've got some recommendations in the report on, you know, on the numbers of homegrown players, the introduction into the Premier League of uh, club trained players. All of that is in the report. I mean, what's interesting about the report, I think, is everybody I've spoken to accepts the analysis. They all accept there's an issue. But of course, it's like everything in Britain, you know, everybody accepts there's an issue, but they don't want it to change their bit. They don't, want the, they don't want a solution that changes their bit. They want it to change somebody else's bit. I mean, if you look at what we said, we looked at a number of different issues, of which the player pathway was only one of them. We looked particularly, and we're, and we're still doing work on them, we will come out with uh, proposals about coaching, because I think we need to change our structure and system of coaching in this country. Well, that's what we're told. And we're looking at facilities for kids particularly but wider facilities uh, and one of the things we're almost certain to come out with is a, a, a new ambition for the number of all weather pitches in this country if you look at the numbers if you look at the numbers here and you compare us with holland and germany similar climates we are miles behind and some of the, there's a lot of money in football more of it needs to go to all weather facilities and we'll come out with uh, some recommendations on that and how we think it can be done uh, this autumn. I wouldn't have taken this job if I wasn't committed to change because I've been around football for a while, you know, from buying rights, from helping set up the Premier League. I know that will make some of you think I'm the worst person in the world. But right the way through, uh, to chairing a, a lower league club, you know, I, in, in my time Brentford was in Division 2 and Division 1, it wasn't in um, the Championship, which is where it's managed to get there, scrape there without me. Um, but, so I know about those issues. I, I genuinely believe that some more money needs to go from the top of the game to the bottom of the game. Um, but there's no point doing it if all we're going to do is spend it, without being rude to the players, on, on players' wages. There's no point pouring more money, getting more money to go down to divisions one and two, if actually that money just increases the wages yet again. What we need is a financial stability for some of those clubs. When I was chairman of Brentford, everywhere I went, I'd go and find the chief executive or the chairman of the club we were playing and say, 
how do you keep this club going? And almost without exception, they were kept going by somebody putting money in. And that is no way to run a football club. Because in the end, that someone stops putting the money in and then you get a financial crisis. Well, I think one of the problems we have to look at in football is if you look at who's playing, is if you look at who's supporting, they don't... And then I look at the FA, the FA Council. It doesn't represent them. You know, it's still overwhelmingly male, overwhelmingly white, in a world that isn't overwhelmingly male and white in football. And somehow, that has to be changed. Now, that has to be changed. We have to try to change it, but we're not alone. Supporters have got to try and change it as well. We've got to, we've got to look at how do we involve the population of 20th century England, 21st century England, and that, the mix that it's got in football governance. Because if we just carry on like this, old white males, then we're going to become increasingly irrelevant. In terms of, I mean, the competitions we're in charge in the FA Cup, I mean, we are aware of ticket prices. You know, as a board, we actually threw out the proposed increases in the ticket prices for the FA Cup final this year. In terms of fans, I, uh, I was amazed that in Brazil, by the support of the fans, even for the third game, which was irrelevant to them. The numbers that were still there, the applause they gave the England team. And I think all over the world, people would um, envy the support that the English football structure has got from the fans. You know, we're very lucky. And the England football team is lucky. The English are good at supporting sporting events. Um, but I do think it's important that those voices are heard. Uh, and I'm not sure having one person on the FA Council is actually um, proper representation. Actually, in Brazil, I, I quite liked getting out in amongst the fans. Um, you know, the night before in, in, in the towns, I would go out and just go and talk to the fans find out what they were thinking, how they were there. Because it seems to me that's what you need to know about football. When I was chairman of a club, you know, go and find out from the fans what they thought. And of course, they, what they thought largely depended on whether you were winning or losing. Um, and I, you know, if you're the chairman of a club and you're not doing well, you, you, you expect abuse. Uh, but if you're winning, then you're a bit of a hero. So, I mean, it, it, it just depends. But. Uh, I, what the fans think, are we providing them with the proper facilities, are we providing them with what they need and what they want, it really matters in football. In terms of the commission, we invited anybody, send us in your evidence. We got a lot of uh, people who wrote to us, just individual fans, and we read them all and we considered them all. Now, some of them won't like what we came up with, some of the suggestions we came up with, they would like others. Of course, a lot of fans think you could just easily change the, England, the, the position of English footballers by dictate from the FA. Well, I'm afraid you can't. And that was our problem. So what we were trying to do was come up with a mix which, would, which was sellable to all parts. Yeah, once again, sorry I can't be with you. Um, I'd be interested to hear back from your debate today. Uh, and we've got a meeting with Supporters Direct and the Football Supporters Federation in the near future to get that. All I would ask you is when you have that debate, don't just say, well, we oppose that, we don't like that, look what it does to us. Also say, well, how do we overcome the problem then? Because if you, if you can't come up with positive solutions, if you just want to stick with yesterday, nothing's going to change. In which case, uh, finding... A, squad, a talented squad to go to the World Cup in eight years' time, it's going to be pretty tough.